Hello friends, Anderson here. Welcome back to Worlds Without a Number, the setting creation series for our upcoming Scarlet Heroes campaign. The stack of books I am staring at you over is partly your fault because I did put out the call for a bunch of random table books and resources for random generation of a zero prep campaign that will also help us once we're actually in play in our city of Colrain here and boy did you deliver so thanks for that that is however a matter for a separate video that i will eventually make and by eventually i mean pretty soon the only book that i really want to already put to use is the ultimate toolbox because i already used printouts of that and that one was also the one that was the hardest to find since it's actually been out of print for like a decade or something so thanks for all your recommendations, thanks for all your comments, and that's also what we're going to start with today, and then we'll transition into some more history building for the next two or three factions, and then we'll probably do the same thing again next week, and potentially have another final closing video to tie up all the loose ends that we no doubt will end up generating. So thanks again for your participation. Thanks for liking the video, for commenting, for subscribing to the channel. It's been quite a ride with this series and we're not even done yet. So let's get to it. Let's go right into the comment section and milk it because there was a lot. I will link the document again in the video description. I didn't do it last time. I linked that one as well. It's a bit shorter, but for today there is quite something and some rather monumental things as well considering how long we've been fishing for some of these and uh, we finally have a name for the tieflings and that name is Ofrites because Ofra was their generator if you will and based on the comments and some back and forth we had there I also wanted to reflect a lot of the other ideas which means that the Ofrite terminology is what tieflings call themselves it's not necessarily what others call them so as a memento to that twisted origin tieflings formally refer to themselves as offer its other names and more derogatory terms include but definitely not limited to curse blood bloodborne the damned the godlings the shadowy ones the shadow kin the shadow folk and a plethora of other similarly themed terminology now, Ofra, as the nasty god that was brought down and was the devourer of souls, is a very strange touch point to take pride in. And the derivative source of the name is the pride part of Ofra society takes in bringing down a god and absorbing the essence, thereby becoming sort of godlike and taking that as almost a mandate to conquer the world in the name of this new flesh god culture that they have founded. Whereas we also decided that this is probably not a universal sentiment and there is a second strata in off-right society that considers itself cursed by this tainted blood of the old god that they killed and that originated their people. And we also decided that this is probably just working as intended and that off-right society sees no contradiction in those two viewpoints, in fact sees them as necessary, sort of a yin-yang setup, where between the whispers of the hawkish, prideful offrites who see it as their own god-given mandate to take over rulership of the entire dominion of the world, of Aina, the other side, the dove-like, for lack of a better term, remorseful, atonement-seeking offrites, also have the ears of the ruler and between that tension field as a compromise decisions are made so the opulence the ruler of the prosperity of chandra has equal advisorship from both the warlike off rights and the atoning off rights and every so often one listens too closely to one of the faction and it never ends well Next up, a name for our MacGuffin Unobtainium and another facet to the MacGuffin Unobtainium because we got a very good piece of input regarding the death of the gods and that it would also probably yield some kind of residue, that death material of the gods of the old pantheon. 
that is a fallout from the gods dying, where the original MacGuffin was supposed to be a product of the gods being born, and by extension of that, I wanted to create it in a way where the birth material is rarer and clean and not as dangerous and the death material that is left behind by the dying gods is sort of the same stuff but tainted by the blood component so by the physical forms of the god disappearing dying melting into the ground turning into lava all of that so we have the original MacGuffin material, the tainted MacGuffin material, and the actual devices that are the MacGuffin. And in terms of a name, I went with a lot of synonyms that I ran the various terminology that you suggested to me through, and I hit upon the word Paragon, and I think that's a pretty good word. So we have the original essence, which is the primal Paragon, the tainted essence, which is the tainted Paragon, and the devices, which are the Gunardian workings, because working was already a term suggested and proposed by Worlds Without Number anyway, we'll just stick Gunardi in front of it, and in common parlance it'll just be called a workings. And the Paragon itself in common parlance will also have a lot of different terms, because the term of Paragon is mostly used officially by the guilds and the artificers and the sanctioners and whoever else, whereas the common populace refers to it as Godstone, Soulstone, Sacred Ash, Ether, Mana, just all kinds of terms that, that bundle into this idea of an ethereal substance. And also one of the things that arises from the fact that there was a tainted version of this means that it must be distilled and cleansed before use, otherwise it has disastrous consequences, so it it will warp things around it, it will cause spontaneous eruptions of mutation or open gates into different dimensions, sort of like a, an unprotected warp stone with no galler field, something like that. And that's one of the primary functions of the guild as well, of the sanctioning body of this material, that they cleanse it. And conversely, the black marketeers do it too. They just don't do it as well. So every now and again, you have a situation where some secret cleansing lab blows up half a city block in coal rain because they made a little oopsie in cleansing their latest batch of pilfered tainted paragon. That's kind of the drift I got out of a lot of comment input and condensed it into this and I really really like this outcome. Which also leads us again to the artificers themselves. The name for them is still pending. One suggestion was the maintainers. I think that's also a pretty good name. I would think some synonym in that direction is the way to go. So if you have an idea, fire away. Same goes by the way for our guild, the guild that sanctions the distribution of the Paragon substance. And I was starting to think of them as the sanctioners. So if that's something that rings true to you, then yeah, we'll call them the sanctioners. And otherwise, if you have some idea bounced off of that, also feel free to let me know. I don't want to name them in today's episode, but I want to name them before the series is over. So, as far as the artificers go, there was a thought that considering their past, their checkered history, and the fact that no one really liked them even before the old gods died, maybe they, even though they're part of the Cabal, do not really want all of the gods back, they just want Gunardi back. And I like that idea, and I think I can extrapolate from that that they are playing basically their own game double crossing everybody so they are inside the cabal to use it to further their cause of bringing gunardi back with their grandest working and the grandest experiment but they also subvert the cabal's goals where they can get away with it to bring back some of the other gods so whenever a lich of the cabal with their own faction gets close to resurrecting I don't know, the dwarven god of minor misfortunes, they somehow thwart this and make sure it doesn't really happen, but they always take that knowledge away and incorporate it in their own experiments to bring Gunardi back and Gunardi only, because they are excluded from everybody else and they always do their own thing. So 
the fact that everybody distrusts them is very warranted and a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's that. And then there's also our rebellious noble. And we had some input there with regards to the rival partner that is part of the reason that this rebellious noble is successful in their schemes or at least some element and component of their scheme, of their ambition. And one idea was what if that's the sovereign, uh, the surrogate, sorry, the uh, sovereign of the assemblage who we call the surrogate. And that's an interesting thought. So there was also a proposal where they may be lovers before and I think we don't even really know much about the surrogate themselves. So that's even still quite a possibility that we can explore at some point. But the fact that the surrogate is this rival partner makes sense to me because what happens if Ilanis, our high noble rebellious person, manages to actually replace or force a replacement of the current surrogate with somebody else, not herself or maybe herself, while well, she's beholden to Jezebeth who is pulling the strings in the background. So she works with the surrogate, the rival partner, as a setup to at the point where she's ready to make the move on the surrogate, also use the guild, the sanctioner guild, the connections of the surrogate with it and the government body to first make a move against the black marketeers. So basically wanting to cut those strings that Jezebeth has over her roughly at the same time that she comes into power, playing a double, triple crossing game which of course raises the question, is Jezebeth aware of this and playing like a quadruple crossing game and we're getting into like Patrick Stewart double take, triple take, quadruple take territory here where the amount of double, triple, quadruple crossings are getting a bit out of hand. But this is like the kind of manipulations on that level that I think are going on. So yeah, the surrogate is the rival partner and is being used or maybe even conscious of the fact and goes along with it that Ilanis can set it up in a way that she might be able to rid herself of Jezebeth's influence while at the same time using Jezebeth's influence. So that's the thought there. And lastly, we had the device, the working that we decided was the body modification of Ilanis and I maybe due to playing with too much Elden Ring, immediately thought about the arm and, you know, millennia and popping that in, in case you play the game. But we got a suggestion it could be the eyes, and that is very fitting. Like this working's eyes with the power of the primal paragon behind it, the things that it can show you, that is probably very conducive to a personage like Elanis. And also the fact that she has that, that's probably also what makes her beholden to Jezebeth. The availability of the amount of primal paragon that she needs to power that quote unquote vanity body modification with its own purpose, this mesmerizing set of eyes, that probably consumes a lot of paragon. And that's an amount that she will have a hard time getting from the sanctioners, especially since she's on the outs with them a little bit. So that could be an in for Jezebeth to have a whole like as the pusher kind of person. So it'll be the eyes and they are the divine modifications that Ilanis has. So all in all, quite a great amount of input. And now we can jump back into the history table. And like I said, at the end of the previous episode, we still have a loose end for the Dorajan assemblage, which was that a grand scheme had gone horribly wrong. We'll table that until we know more about the other factions. Maybe we can tie it in with some other event. And I think the next faction that we are going to tackle the history of are going to be the Black Marketeers. So Jezebeth's bunch who she is not the leader of, but the main backer and puppeteer of. So we have a look at our historical events chart and we use our percentage dice to generate the first of the two events that we want to explore. 70 poverty, aha, I think we may have an idea how Jezebeth entered the picture because the description here says, circumstances conspire to reduce the group to a state of great poverty and harsh simplicity for a time. 
that I would read that there was a very successful guild crackdown by the sanctioners and that basically cut off the black marketeers from their supply lines for a while and almost forced them out of business and it was only the funding injection and the connections maybe to some kind of off-right chandrite secret service we still don't know where the loyalties lie that let Jezebeth supply the means of survival for our black marketeers and that is how they are beholden to her. I note down poverty, a crackdown by the sanctioning guild almost forced the black market out of business but Jezebeth swooped in and saved the day via a campaign of assassination, political maneuverings and financial backing. Sounds pretty plausible. Let's make another one. 26 Exodus. A significant chunk of the group packed up and left for some superior land. Well, supposedly superior land. I mean, these are historical events that are more for nations and we scale it down a bit. What could it mean? I think it could mean that this is the origin of our current troubles that befall adventurers who return from the Field of Ruins in our Megaplex out there, where there is a new group in town that tries to rob them of their, well, sort of ill-gotten but not really gains. So basically before the black market or the guild gets their hand on them, and initially we suspected maybe the prosperity of Chandra is behind it, that could still be the case. But I think then what this tells us is that this group that is currently trying to get as much of our Paragon resource into their hands as possible, and that through robbery, is a group of former black market thugs. So Exodus, a schism in the black marketeers, so a large number of the more thuggish members leave and set up a rival outfit which uses force and robbery to acquire as much Paragon as possible for some unknown reason. And maybe it's the prosperity of Chandra behind it, maybe it's the Gunardi artificers behind it who want to get a quota of Paragon that the Sanctioner Guild, which is also suspicious of them, has no hold of or can't keep track of because they need large quantities to resurrect their gods. So maybe this is related to the followers of Gunardi. We don't know, but it's not unlikely that this is something we might come into contact with because this is like criminal underworld business and this is something our future character might very well stumble into, at least on the lowest rung of the ladder at the very beginning. So we'll definitely keep it in mind that there is something there. I'm thinking one thing we can do to help us figure out, just as a closing of this particular history, what the end goal of acquiring all this Paragon for our Schism faction of the Black Market is, would be to generate who their leader is, who drives this Schism, and then maybe that tells us something about the reason behind it. So let's get ourselves an origin again and uh, gender and then see what we have. We have 93 and a 2. So we have a female rat folk. <laughs> it's a Skaven. Right, I think this is where the ultimate toolbox comes in with a lot of potential names. Let's see here, evil rogue names maybe, that could be a thing. Or we go for... Well, this is just more of the Xanathar, so... Mm, evil rogue. This is definitely an evil rogue. So let's roll a 20-sided and see what our rat folk, schismatic former black marketeer turned fuck leader for Paragon robbery is called. Three, Chisra Ralem. That, I can see that as a good 
rat folk name Chizra. Okay, so Chizra, Ralam, and her merry bunch are relieving adventurers of Paragon when they return from the ruin field. Which of course makes us wonder why, which is why we did this in the first place. So burning ambitions of Chizra, which means one more roll with all dice on the burning ambitions table. All right, what do we got? We have, when was the ambition sparked? It came after mature adulthood. That's a three. Who knows or has been involved in it? That's a five on the die six. They've gotten rivals involved somehow. Okay. Not sure who that could be yet, but maybe we get a clue in the next ones. What tools are used to advance it? Die eight, that's a three. They've resorted to magical means of eight, okay. Is that more the prosperity? Is that more the Gunardi followers? It's almost more leaning towards the Gunardi followers because I think the prosperity, while they use magic, it's more of a guile. It's either guile or force, you know? Magic as a tool, but magic itself as a primary makes me think of more the artificer side of things. What's the basic ambitions form? Die 10 and 8. To kill or ruin a hated rival. So a rival is involved somehow and the main reason that Chisra is doing all this is to kill or ruin a heated rival. Hmm. Right. Let's move on. What's the biggest immediate obstacle is a five. They've suffered a recent considerable setback. Interesting. And things to help or hinder the ambition. Three. A book with critical information in it. Okay. If I combine the magical means, the recent setback and the book, I get the sense that this is some kind of tome that Chisra located after mature adulthood, which planted this idea in her head. And the setback is that she's now lost it. And maybe she's lost it because the rival had it stolen? And then who is this rival that this book triggered Chisra to pursue a schism of the black market guild and take all of the thuggish element and make an outfit that then robs everybody of their hard-earned paragon. Hmm. I think she wants to take over the... Well, it's a two-pronged plan, if you can call it that. The ambition is to put the black marketeers out of business take over the share rather, deprive the black marketeers of their share of the Paragon, get it herself, ultimately to undermine the sanctioners to also deprive them and as, as a last big bang to free the resource itself for the artificers without the guild, the sanctioners, getting in the way so at the same time funneling the resource to resurrect gunardi and then also freeing the paragon resource to put the artificer in charge of it so the artificers are the beneficiary of this bunch of thugs and we can maybe envision this book as a book that had some secrets of gunardi locked in it and Chisra, as a very intelligent and ambitious person, managed to crack the code somehow. Managed to then figure out a few things about the artificers, tried to blackmail them, but instead became a convert. And they let her in on some secrets, and now she is a ambitious part of their scheme to secure the Paragon resource for themselves. So, Chisra found an artificer tome and crack the code trying to blackmail the artificers and the end game is to put both the black marketeers and the guild out of business but somebody stole that book that she found we thought maybe it was a rival but it only really says that there is a book with critical information and there was a recent setback so it doesn't have to be the rival that stole it which gives us another thief tie-in, so maybe it was a contact of our future character that stole it, and we get involved in this by these means and get a few more insights into this 
whole criminal underbelly. So that's a nice lead to derive from the existence of Chisra, all as a consequence of this exodus role on the history of the Black Marketeers, which we've now finished. That leads us to the Sanctioners themselves. That's still my working title. So if you do have a better idea, like I said, give it a shot. But for now, we'll refer to them as the Sanctioners and we will generate a historic event for them. Or rather, we will generate two. Number one is 42 great infrastructure, meaning what? Some tremendous work of infrastructure was accomplished. Canals, vast walls, roads, aqueduct, mines, or the like. Again, scaling this down to a guild with this particular purpose instead of a nation, we think of, well, we think of purification and cleansing the paragon, the tainted paragon. We think of a place that is a dominant structure in the cityscape, a manufacture that emits some kind of nightmarish fog from its exhaust that is high up over the city. Or maybe we think of something deep underground even where since they want to kind of keep the taint of the Paragon contained, they have a subterranean complex that purifies either or. I sense a 50-50, <laughs> 51 plus it's above ground, 50 and below it's below ground. 99, it's above ground and well above ground. So we have an above ground structure that is the great working of the guild that stabilized the process of purifying the Paragon in a very clear and relatively risk-free manner. Whereas the even the purified Paragon of the Black Marketeers isn't quite as risk-free and can come with rare side effects of like, you know, warping, mutation, things like that. So this is just a landmark now in the cityscape where this enormous factory dominates the guild quarter and it has this haze coming out where the taint is separated from the Paragon and you see this smoke column which has these distorted faces in it, mouth open in agony, and it's something that the locals of Coal Rangers learn to live with and ignore. So the working, the factory works of the Sanctioner Guild, the purification works, that's the great infrastructure, and it gives them the ability to purify it close to 100%. Is there a sinister secret behind the purification process? Is there the influence of somebody else behind it and this will all backfire horrendously? Probably, I mean, hopefully. So we'll find out. Next historical event for this particular faction. 91, twist of fate, roll again, huh? If the event was positive, twist it to ultimately be a negative to the group and vice versa. Oh, that's an interesting one. Huh, getting a bit mind bending towards the end here. Let's roll again. 54, magical disaster. So a magical blessing, I see. Some large scale magical disaster scarred the group, either natural in nature or the result of some sorcerer's doings. Aha! Uh -huh. So are the guild, have the guild members of the Sanctioners somehow devised a process that makes them magically enhanced as a byproduct of their various procedures, maybe even as a byproduct of this purification procedure that they have, that they can control the residual background mutations that happen when it comes to their own faction. That could be interesting. So what if the magical residue that emanates from the Paragon being consumed is and purified is causing all kinds of random changes as we've determined in the role for 
our city itself, but that the sanctioners have found a way to channel this, to steer what happens, and they can sort of modify features of themselves up to a degree, of course, which means that they can have magical enhancements, and that's something only they really have by design. A byproduct of the consumption of Paragon is minor mutations and magical warpings. The guild has found a way to control these and magical enhancements among guild members are the norm. Nice. Now I just got a beep beep from my timer, which means my recording time is up, otherwise this episode will run too long. We've managed a lot of lore, we've managed quite a bit of history, we've met a new character and we've created a lead for a future involvement of a thief in this whole complex. So all in all, a pretty good night's work. I look forward to your input. If you have any thoughts on any of the topics that we touched on today or any of the topics we touched on in the prior videos just fire away we can still add to everything and explore more and we'll do more history next week and address more of the comments and then we'll do another wrap up of loot ends in the week after so thanks very much for watching i'll catch you next time and bye for now